Could I first invite um, Professor Dame Nancy Rothwell, who we all know, of course, President and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Manchester, who will give us, I think, predominantly an academic perspective, but of course, Nancy has considerable uh, experience as both a scientist herself and as a non-executive director on AstraZeneca and chair of the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology. So, Nancy, warm welcome. Thank you very much indeed, uh, John. It's great to be uh, asked to be here with the impossible task of predicting 2025. Um, I'm very, very bad at crystal ball gazing, and most of my predictions in the past have been wildly inaccurate. And so what I'm going to do, if you like, is, is say a little bit about where I think we're going, the forward trajectory, where I'd like us to be with, with just a few predictions which will inevitably be wrong. I'm sure we'll all talk about which are going to be the hot areas in biology and medicine, and I doubt there will be disagreement, uh, and I'll at the end just give you my list. But rather than saying we'll have cured various diseases, we'll understand biological processes, I, I thought of it in a slightly different way, which was the, the what, the who, the how, and the where. And the what will we be doing in universities spans not only research but education. Thinking about it, um, the 10 to 15 year olds now will be graduating with their PhDs or in medicine in 2025. And they've had a very different education to those of us in this room. And education, I think uh, we have to include consideration of pre-university education. Very timely at the moment with the debate, I think, happening today about the role of practicals in A-level classes. And two key messages, I think, for the future are the importance that science and medicine are practical subjects. You don't just learn them from reading in a book. And the more practical experience in the future, the better it will be. And secondly, the plea that I'm sure others will make, that we need stronger mathematical and analytical skills for almost every aspect of life sciences and medicine. But I think we also have a job to do in blurring the boundaries. In universities, one of our greatest challenges now is that we're faced with multidisciplinary problems, that we work in disciplinary silos. I heard a great quote the other day from somebody who said, industry has problems and universities have departments. <laughs> it's not so far from the truth, actually. We're all trained in onology and then have to do something that bears little relation to it. And many of the problems we are facing now, let alone in 2025, will involve not just those in the life sciences and the physical sciences, but indeed many in the social sciences, in geography, in po politics, in many other areas. So I think a challenge for us over the coming 10 years or so will be how can we address the specialities that are required, particularly in medicine and allied professions, where the depth of knowledge is really important, but also in part on those individuals, those leaders of the future, the ability to jump between disciplines, to work with people who speak different languages. And, and that will be key to my final point. We'll be dealing with ever more complex problems. Of course, the easy ones we've probably done. Whether it's in a university or whether it's in industry, the hard diseases remain. And, and of course, we will all speak about uh, those on aging, diabetes, if you like, uh, new infections, and so on. But learning is changing dramatically. It's changing from the classroom to distance learning. Uh, I estimate that at most universities, at least half their students will be in another part of the world by 2025. Does that matter? Maybe not. Uh, I hope that by then there will be a blurring of boundaries in terms of migration. And I'm sure this will be treated excessively, as I say, that science and uh, medicine and life sciences in the UK can only benefit from inward migration of outstanding individuals, whether as students or as qualified scientists and clinicians. So the who also pervades to the how, because where will the balance be between the individual and the team? between the very focused person who answers a question and the blue skies maverick thinker. My hope, my aspiration, is that there will be all of those and that some will be both individuals and team members. Many will be one of the other. The problems we're facing now are so great that it's unlikely that individuals will be able to solve them. And we have to look to ways of support, funding and recognition that value the individual in the team that might not be the first or the last on the pu publication, might not be the principal investigator on the grant, but whose contribution is absolutely critical. This will be particularly true as technologies become ever more demanding. 
and skilled technologists will be essential for discoveries of the future. Collaboration versus competition. There's a big issue at the moment in the United Kingdom that most of the ways we fund and we assess the research we do drives competition between institutions even next door to each other. I think in the future we must be looking at what can the UK and indeed globally do together to tackle problems and we'll have to change the drivers of behaviour because if you drive academics to be competitive they are absolute masters at it and they will do everything possible to win that competition even though it might not be to the greater good of the disease, of the discovery, of the country or even of the world. I think there will be a blurring of boundaries geographically as well as between disciplines. There will be more big international collaborations. I hope there will be more collaborations between funders. There's a good record in the United Kingdom of funding of life sciences and medicine and a good uh, evidence of collaboration between them. I think that needs to increase ever more. There will inevitably be clusters, but I was very taken by the outcome of Andrew Whitty's review, which I was a member of, and Andrew, I think, started with a very strong sense of place where things happen and clusters around them. And I saw a, a subtle shift, and Patrick will correct me if I'm wrong, to saying actually the whole of the UK is a cluster. We're really not that big compared to some other clusters around the world. Of course, uh, uh, I hope that we will maintain a very, very strong link uh, with Europe and with our global partners. Another thing that we absolutely have to get right and have to be better at is the innovation model. I think universities work very much better with the commercial sector than they used to. I think they work very much better with the health sector than they used to. That's not to say there isn't a long way to go. And it tends to be a unilateral direction of travel rather than an iterative process. And I'm sure others will have uh, more expertise to talk about that uh, in the future. I think there are questions about intellectual property and about open data as well as about open publishing particularly in areas where we are dealing with wider public good, where the protection of intellectual property may not be the best thing. But at the same time, where we know that exploitation of discoveries can only be done by very large companies with very large resources. And I think that's a fine balance for the future that we're going to have to address. So I, I've mentioned a little bit of the what, the who, the how, and the where. But, but I, I want to, in the last few minutes, uh, focus on something that I think is incre incredibly important, which is dissemination, communication, and involvement. I think in health sciences in particular, there will be much greater public involvement, not just on patient user groups, but actually major public experiments, major contributions and involvement in our decision making. We were discussing at a meeting earlier today that um, uh, John and I were at uh, that, that public trust in a lot of what we do is not as good as it could be. Look back to the late 1950s and 1960s, and the polls said that scientists and clinicians were amongst the most trusted. Funding was at its highest, particularly in the United States. And we also discussed something that I'd heard about previously, and that is that fear provokes scientific funding. And by that I mean countries threatened by war or invasion tend to put a lot of money into science. So let's not hope we have to do that. Uh, a colleague of mine wrote an article in The Economist claiming that he was very concerned that there was almost no funding for fundamental science, but his solution would be his hope that a meteor would be heading to Earth that would be due to hit in 30 years' time, and it would mobilize all the scientific force collectively and collaboratively to deal with it. Um, I'm, I'm hoping there's a better way uh, of dealing with it than that. So I think... Engagement and public trust are going to be incredibly important. And I would hope that by 2025, every scientist, clinician, or related, is an expert in communicating with people outside their own area. I think it's one of the most important things that we as universities and others can deliver in the future. Because without public trust, we will have very significant I said I would mention some of my uh, uh, pet areas, if you like, that I think we need to deal with. Uh, I think, obviously, many complex systems, the complex bio biology of development, of aging, of multifactorial diseases. Again, we, we were reminded the other day um, at the meeting that it's estimated that approximately 50% of disease in the Western world is driven by behaviours, yet about 1% of our funding goes on changing behaviour. So understanding the brain and behaviour, mental health, I think, are massive challenges. I would say that as a neuroscientist, of course, wouldn't I? 
I think then there are real challenges around areas where the economic model just doesn't work at, at the present time. Anti-infective agents is one that Patrick will be more qualified than I am to talk about, but the economic payback just does not justify at the present time the investment that is re required to, teach to treat existing infections, let alone those that may emerge and those that are resistant to our current disease, current treatments, or indeed those uh, that lead to pandemics. So the last thing that I want to say to you is that um, in spite of concerns, um, in spite of many areas we have to tackle, I think the United Kingdom is actually in a very strong position. We have outstanding training facilities, we have extra outstanding funding, not least through the charitable sector as well as through the government. We have a national health service, we should not forget that, that's of huge value to universities. And the better we can work with that national health service, the better the good overall. So while I would say for 2025 I, I, I couldn't tell you I have no fears, I generally have a lot of hopes. Thank you.